All right, can you all hear me? All right. Okay, so this is a really different talk, um, although I do mention Moore's Law, which um, I will now refer to as a Baud's vision. Oh, sorry. A Baud. I always get that wrong. All right, so um, my interaction with um, the field of augmented reality um, probably first began when I was six years old. Uh, my brother and I used to play with little plastic dinosaurs in the basement of our parents' house. Um, and um, how many people here played with plastic dinosaurs when they were kids? I'm just, am I the only one? No, I'm not. Okay, I'm not the only one. And the fascinating thing when you're six years old is that, is that they, um, they're amazing. They'll do everything. You know, you go and, and have battles with them and go on adventures. Sometimes there are very epic romances between two dinosaurs. And as far as I was concerned, the dinosaurs really were interacting with me and, and I think that was a good thing. I got a little older and I read um, a book that's very popular in the US for kids, um, Harold and the Purple Crayon. Um, it's a very simple idea. It was uh, published in 1951. And the idea is that um, there's a little boy who has a purple crayon. and Whatever he draws becomes real and he interacts with it in his world. And that made perfect sense to me. Um, and I think that was good. Um, and then I got a little older than that. Um, and I worked on Tron, um, the first good one. Um, <laughs> and. And which, by the way, was, um, not everyone knows this, was actually mostly inspired by an idea from Alan Kay, which when, when you, once you know that, it's not surprising. Um, and this was also a story about going into strange worlds where anything's possible. But I found it to be a little frustrating working on it because the technology at the time didn't really let us have very rich visual worlds. Everything looked like it came from a computer. So then the very next thing I did was start to develop techniques to make computer graphics to help it look more realistic, more part of our world, so we could sustain this wonderful fantasy that the things we create with a computer and the things we make with the real world are all part of um, a continuum that's a continuum of our imagination. And then a few years after that, um, they started using those techniques in movies and eventually um, they were making dinosaurs. Yay. So, so I, felt, I felt vindicated. Um, but there was a problem in that seeing a dinosaur running around on a screen or some science fiction fantasy um, is not the same as playing with little plastic dinosaurs. When you play with little plastic dinosaurs and you're sitting there in the basement with your brother setting things up and um, mixing them with the cavemen, even though you know that's not right, um, you already know that by six, um, you just, you feel like you're really in something. And I think this comes, you know, the human species, as far as we can tell, has been around for about, in its current form, about 195,000 years. And in that time, we, we already had these powerful instincts develop, which have allowed us to survive. And those instincts pretty much hover around. We like to hang out with each other. We like to talk to each other. We like to physically gather. We like body language and eye contact and physical proximity. And so a lot of the visions that I've been seeing recently that have been hovering around virtual reality, um, you know, for example, Ready Player One, I find them to be, and maybe they're meant to be, a bit dystopian because they're not really about physical connection. In 2006, I read this wonderful book by Werner Vinge, Rainbow's End. How many people have read Rainbow's End? So the rest of you, that's your homework. You have to read this. It's a novel that takes place about 40 years in the future. And, um, and everybody's wearing. What that means is they pop in the contact lenses in the morning and they can see whatever they want. There's also the equivalent audio stuff. And the interesting thing about this vision is this is a vision of the future where um, um, we are in our physical bodies. We're in the physical world. We walk around. People eat together, they drink beer together, they make love, they're actually in the world together, but the technology has moved into us um, through um, what I used to call Moore's Law. Um, so so here's, here's the thing, is that, is that I think that, as, as I think Greg pointed out, variants of this, things will keep doubling, it's just different things will keep doubling every year. And, 
the technology will continue to advance, but often as it has before in very surprising ways. Sometimes materials, sometimes communication, sometimes power, sometimes CPU, sometimes GPU, which I don't think people ex even really understood until Sutherland. So, um, so we're going to have something. I don't know what it's going to be like, but whatever it's like, it's going to be normal. It's going to be just part of her everyday life. It's going to maybe be a pair of glasses. Maybe it'll have a 6K six, six by 6K um, projection element and a little holographic optical element and some way to get a light pipe to connect them. But we won't be looking at it. We won't be looking at it anymore. We look at the fact that, my gosh, I'm wearing clothing. Clothing is technology. There's nothing natural about clothing. In fact, natural would really be you're all naked. Um, which sometimes when I'm, you know, getting nervous, I imagine that, um, and it helps me. Am I the only one who does that? Okay, good. I feel, feel better. Um, but, but the thing is that this isn't just science fiction anymore because Moore's Law has been continuing. And for, exact, for example, at SIGGRAPH 2017, there was a paper by a group at Microsoft Research. Um, and you can see how early it is because it's literally 3D printed. But they have, um, um, these are two laser projectors and these are very carefully constructed holographic optical elements. And they do a pretty good job already over a year ago of with the right signal sent to um, those laser projectors of, you know, you get a wide field of view, you get um, high resolution, you get full color, um, and this is something that exists. Um, so this means that in some amount of time, you know, as we keep moving forward HoloLens and Magic Leap 1 and as we keep going, um, at some point it's probably going to be in the next five years in one form or another, we're at the consumer level. And consumer level means, you know, these things, hundreds of millions, everybody assumes they have them. Um, we're going to have the ability to say, hey, if I see this, um, if I wear this and I'm just like putting on my glasses and no one's thinking about the fact that I'm wearing my glasses, we just accept that I'm wearing my glasses, it means I'm going to see things in the world and they're going to be part of the built world. Nobody here is freaking out about the fact that I'm making images show up on that screen. We just, it's just normal. It's technology that we know exists and that we, we pretty much grew up with. We've all grown up with projectors. Um, so. So similarly, when you're walking around and there's a virtual object or even a virtual creature that is looking back at you and interacting with you, it's just going to be part of the world. But that's not the most exciting thing. Um, personally, I think that the greatest power up that we ever had in human communication, I mean, not language itself because that's an instinct, that's something that we evolved, but the greatest artificial power up happened about about 5,300 years ago when we started developing written language. Because written language was the moment when you put something down and thousands of years later millions of people can actually read your thoughts. Um, and I don't think anything has been as fundamental since then, even though we've had some really cool stuff like, you know, the internet, computers. So, but I think what's going to happen is when people are having face-to-face -face conversations and the screens go away. There are no screens. It's just us talking. And cyberspace goes there. We are going to change fundamentally the way we think about it and the way we use it. And just as kids today grow up in a world where there have always been smartphones, and many of you grow up in a world where there are always the web, um, we're going to have this idea that, that um, that this is going to be reality and it's going to be social reality, but things can go wrong. For example, if I were a large corporation and I really, you know, made money by my, my you know, there was that illusion that everybody thinks they're my customer, but actually it's the advertisers. Shh. Um, I would kind of want a future that looks like this. Right? So I'm just, hey, you're looking at ads, I'm making money. So large corporations might have a really solid reason, you know, it's not that they're evil, it's more that, hey, there's money to be made, um, in putting lots of stuff in front of your face that's not about your conversation with your friend. And I don't want that to happen, which is one reason I'm up here talking to you. Um, so there's another book that inspired me. Steven Pinker wrote a book in 1993 called The Language Instinct, um, in which he gathered together a whole bunch of research by many evolutionary biologists um, and evolutionary linguists. And um, 
And even then, they had very um, strong evidence that language is actually a co-evolution natural language of children. When children start talking to each other, their speech and their ability to connect with each other, children seven and under, is really what fixes language and what evolves language. When you think about it, it's logical. If a child seven and number, under can't learn something, it can't enter the, the natural language. So um, in some sense, the savior of this world, away from just lots and lots of ads, is going to be figuring out how to power up children so that they can use, over time, it might take generations, they can take this opportunity to extend language itself, which is our greatest gift as a species, and make it even more powerful by integrating in a visual component into our conversation. Now, at this point, I want to talk about paradigms. Paradigms um, are, are, it's wonderful to look at what's come before, but sometimes, you know, at some point you have to realize a car is not a steam engine. Um, and that some new set of parameters changes the way you have to think about it. One of my favorite stories, a friend of mine told me that he's, he's in a very liberal city where um, they decided at some point that they were going to make the, um, the public restrooms unisex. Um, and so we all know that there's, you know, there's the men's restroom, and they, they opened a contest, and there's the women's restroom, and they opened this contest to the public to say, um, how would you make a restroom for a city where there's no concept that men and women have to go to different places? And you know, there are a whole bunch of entries. Here was one entry that was just, you know, a man and woman together, um, and we see that here. Um, there were some other people who got a little more conceptual um, and, you know, they went with the, um, you know, there's the Mars sign for men. Um, there's the, um, I think it's the Venus sign for women. And they put those together and they said, oh, we're going to make a new glyph and extend. And actually, this is now one of the extended ASCII characters, I think. Um, and this, we just put this on the door. But the winning entry, which was the one that kind of just, you know, said, hey, we've got a new paradigm here. The winning entry and the one they ended up using ended up looking more like, um, more like this. <laughs> Which when you think about it makes sense. So we have to have that ability to kind of jump out of received assumptions. For example, when I draw in the air, and the very fact that I'm drawing in the air, we're all really seeing it with our future wearables, um, is being mediated by computers, you have an opportunity that the way you draw something says something about its behavior. You don't think about that when you're drawing on paper, but um, um, you can actually give a lot of information in the way you draw something. For example, here's a fish. Um, here's another fish. You know, these two fishes are about the same size. But I've already given a lot of information by the way I drew these fish. So this fish is going to move the way I drew it. This fish is going to move the way I drew that one. And we want this to be this idea of inserting adjectives and adverbs into the behavior of these dynamic objects to be kind of part of the way this language evolved. Now, I have to tell you right now, I don't know what this language will be because it doesn't exist yet, but I think at this point we can start thinking of some principles of what makes sense. For example, right now in 2018, we already have Alexa and Google Home. We already have this idea that as I speak, there is some software that's parsing what I'm saying in real time and can do something about it. So for example, maybe I have a symbol for time and I deploy that visually when I'm having a conversation with people. So maybe um, I'm having a conversation with somebody and somebody says, one of us asks, you know, when is the, um, the WIST conference? And the fact that we are talking about when is the WIST conference should clue in the system that, well, I guess what we really want is an interactive calendar so um, we can talk about time in terms of days and months and years. Um, but I could say the same thing. Oh, I don't want to show that yet. Let's do that next. Um, I could show the same thing and, um, and say the same thing and say, oh, when is Ken's talk? So when is Ken's talk? And um, the system should be smart enough to understand that when I drew the same shape and I said the same thing, the symbol for time should now be inflected toward the context of the conversation um, that we're really having. So yeah, so let's bring this up uh, because 
I now want to talk about this idea of these things. These drawings will exist in the physical world. As far as we're concerned, um, they're going to be part of our built world. So for example, if I'm using my future, you know, um, you know, my finger is being tracked. We can already do that now with my wearable, you know, and I start drawing something um, and it's part of the world. Things should be automatic. This thing, you know, this lamp should figure out that it's on this table and it casts a shadow and it should have lighting that's consistent with the rest of the lighting in the scene. If, um, let's, say, um, let's say, I happen to be someone who really likes dinosaurs. So I draw a little baby dinosaur and that's part of my world. The dinosaur should already come with the idea that it knows about um, my world. It knows about the table. It has, it has things it wants to do. It's interested in eating the yummy plant there. So all these things should happen and these are speech acts which means as speech acts in a language they refer to a lot of things we already know. And I think that's a very important thing for us to understand. And in addition to this idea, wow, I'm gonna have to go faster. Um, we also want to have this notion that we can do things that are actually impossible. So I've always been interested in, for example, in hypercubes. And wouldn't it be great if we grew up in a world where every little child could um, play with a toy hypercube and all of them had a concept intuitively of four-dimensional rotation? Um, I mean, I want to live in that world. So the last thing I think I'll show you, um, because I have just enough time to show this, is um, so you and I are talking face to face, okay? So we're talking face to face. This is, of course, this is just my little computer camera here. Um, and let's say we're sharing some text. There are some really interesting inherent problems um, that I want to share with you. So we're sharing some text. Maybe the text is, maybe we did a, you know, a Google search. The text is floating in the air between us. And we're looking at the same text. Now, unfortunately, we can't be exactly looking at the same text because I'm looking at the text like this. You probably want to look at the text like this. Now, um, um, Hiroshi Ishii and others figured out that if you're on a screen, you can actually mirror reverse people, but you can't mirror reverse them when they're right in front of you. So um, now when you look at the way, um, say, the uh, Chinese and Japanese and Korean, when they do vertical text, when they insert the Western Roman text, they use this solution here, um, but I find this unsatisfying. I'm looking at this, you're looking at this, and we're all looking at text sideways, and it doesn't feel right to me. So we're going to have to solve these problems. My guess is that it'll probably be something like this. This will be a 3D object floating in the air um, and we're all just looking at this thing floating in the air like it's an object. But in fact, what's going to be happening is that I'm looking at it like this and you're looking at it like this, but now we're looking at the same word in the same part of the text and we have that, that idea that what you're looking at is the same as what I'm looking at. There are a lot more things to talk about, but I think what I'll do is I'll open it up to questions and we can show some more things during the Q&A if it comes up. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Ken. <laughs> Roll Vertigal, Queen's University. Um, thank you. Um, sure. I, I, my question is with regard to uh, a value system that would surround this kind of interface. So, yes. Um, I think one of the problems in our field is that we all like to geek out and make little new things, but we never really think about the value system. And uh, I think there's been a tech clash because of that, uh, in particularly the last year. You don't mean everybody in our field, you just mean some people in our field. No, no, no. I, think, I think, you know, <clears throat> Kranzberg's, Kranzberg's first law states that technology is not good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Right, but so, people, people are not technology. So Kranzberg's law tells us that we need to take responsibility. Right. So, so to, my question yeah, to you is, yeah. you know, if we now see babies that swipe on magazines and say, oh, hey, it's not working, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we envelope our kids and teenagers with constant social pressure uh, that they used to just get at school, but now they get it at home as well, uh, if we see that te um, attention spans are getting smaller and there may possibly be physiological changes to the brain because of the technology that we're, we're providing to a generation of, of kids, how how does this play out? Can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. I think that this um, privileging people looking each other in the eyes and having real conversations with each other is good. Privileging distracting them because they don't know what to do with themselves is bad. 
So everything I'm working on is hopefully going to help lead to a world where it's really about you and me having a conversation. And we'll be interested enough in the conversation that things won't distract us and we'll want to keep having it. Now, I can't force that to happen, but I can just kind of see what I can do to help nudge things in that direction. Thank you. Dan Ashbrook, University of Copenhagen. Some of uh, what you were talking about with visual languages and um, inserting new kinds of things into the language mm. reminded me a little bit of American Sign Language. Yes, um, I don't know a huge amount about it, but um, I do know that there's one thing, there's a concept of putting something in the air, and then later on you can just refer back to that by yeah. pointing at it. And so you were just making me think of that. So that's a really good point. I should just point out that if you read the paper, which I, I couldn't include all the things from the paper, this idea of deictics, you know, this and that, and of signs and icons, and there are a whole bunch of concepts um, that exist in any language and in visualization language and, and all the different natural sign languages that I think are going to have to be fundamental elements because we're not changing human brains. We're still going to be learning languages with these universal structures. We have to conform what we do to those. I think you might have been getting at that. Yeah. So one other question, one, the only one up here is, um, do you see a way to do this without drawing? Without what? Drawing. You use drawing as your metaphor. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's say, okay, I'm going to use a prop. This is so cool. All right. Whoa, it's the future. I'm wearing my glasses. I just wanted to put these on because they're so cool. Um, and so you're wearing the wearables and you have speech and I want to talk about an elephant. And I talk about this in the paper. I should just be able to, hey, there's an elephant. You know, I mean, I think what I'm doing now is because I don't have the future technology, I'm trying to excite people's imagination by what's possible. But I think by the time speech and gesture are integrated in a very mature way, we're not going to be overburdening the gesture to double our vocal vocabulary. It's going to be a complement to it. You make me then think of, of Roll's point a little bit, though. I, it drives me crazy when my wife doesn't let me Wikipedia things during conversation. When she, when she what? When she won't let me Wikipedia things oh. during conversation to prove my pedantic How cool. point. Um, <laughs> How many people and, don't let their spouses Wikipedia things during conversations? Just curious. It's like, okay, so oh, <laughs> most people are here with you. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. So, All right. just, just but I mean, right she's crowd. definitely got a point. Like the, the, we're talking about elephants and now there's an elephant is one of these distracting things that, you, that it's both looking people in the eye, but it's also being a distraction from possibly what's actually happening. So I, I guess. I mean, I, you know, there, the whole concept, I mean, this is a much deeper conversation. We probably should cut it short because other people won't ask, but, but the whole concept of people being literate, mm -hmm. you know, of we've both read Shakespeare. I make a quote from Hamlet or, or Woody Allen or something, and you know what I'm talking about, is a form of this. You know, it's a form of education. I'm, I think just as language is something, we couldn't have a conversation if we didn't bring language with us. We can't be learning language in the moment that we're having the conversation any more than someone has a jazz trio and you sit down and you say, how do I play the piano? That wouldn't work. Um, and I think literacy has a similar place. Um, and I'm hoping that, um, and I think it's an important value, that the fact that we could fake knowing things um, in real time, and it's true now for phones, should not replace actual in-depth education where we really understand what they mean, which cannot be done in real time. Yeah. So I don't think anything that I'm doing is changing the importance of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we already spent certain amount of time looking at the screen in the yeah. virtual world. Yeah. And in the virtual world with this social media, people look at the world differently already in the virtual world. But at least now in the real world, we see the same reality. But if everybody wears smart glasses and look at the real world differently, I think it's getting more dangerous. Because okay, so I have two <laughs> comments to that. There are no two human beings who've ever actually seen the same reality. I'm looking at Takeo and you're looking at Ken. Um, and yet we create this theory of object permanence in the first several years of our life where we convince ourselves that there is a consistent world. Also, no two people who ever read a novel have seen the same thing. And it works. 
Uh, so I'm not so sure that the level in which we come together needs to be the precise literal. It needs to be the semantic and the values and everything that actually matters to us. The things that matter to us are not the literal. The thing that matters to us is love, tribalism, mortality, children, uh, you know, just our desire to have children. A lot of the things that you can list off that are most real to us aren't even things you can see. Uh, so I think we need to elevate the conversation to values um, echoing rules point. Um, and then I think we're in the right place to talk about what we want. Yeah, maybe I'm too cautious, but I think there's more chance that bad guys or somebody interfere. Yes, and uh, again, um, the, same, <laughs> the same principle, technology is neither good nor bad nor value neutral. It's still going to be up to us to, uh, to uh, decide who, how not to let bad guys rule, say, somebody's country. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tico Bayagas from HP Labs. I loved the presentation, the talk, the vision was magical and playful, um, but I'm a little troubled by the positioning around human to human in-person conversation. Is that okay. really broken? Do we need that to be mediated? I, I don't, I, I think machine? it's, I think it, um, I think what's happened is we've, we've created due to technological limitations, a temporary divergence between um, certain amounts of emotional connection and intimacy and this. And I think it's a temporary divergence. And I think that if we, um, if we think about the technology intelligently, we can bring those things back together again. Because just watching your facial expression, your body language as I talk to you, I'm learning so much that I would not learn over a text. So I think in a good scenario, that's kind of where you want your, your, your communication power-ups to be. But I'm an optimist. Did you figure that out? I'm an optimist. I'm just, I'm just going to keep drawing random things while we talk because we have a few minutes. Thanks for the talk, Ken. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Jake Wilbrock, University of Washington. Oh, the projector turned off. I'm sorry. I just drew this little guy. I do this little guy because I like dinosaurs. And at one point that I didn't actually get to make is that I think one thing that's important about, to, about these things is not just that we care about these virtual worlds, but that we have this feeling that the virtual world cares about us. And this is like my favorite little guy because he's like checking out my cursor because he's actually very ticklish. This is actually, this is actually a perfect segue because now I'm competing with your dinosaur. <laughs> That actually led, led pretty well into my question. So, um, Perfect. Yeah. So, my, so it seemed like in the examples you presented, the visuals were yeah. largely enhancing and, and accommodating the language um, and, and sort of adding to the language we're exchanging. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you think the other direction, there's kind of a loop that might happen where our language might actually accommodate what we know is possible and not possible with the, enha the enhancements in the visuals. So, in other words, do we say different things because we know, if I say, if I say, um, if I say a polka dotted elephant, and I've had a past experience where when I wanted a polka dotted elephant to be called up, it actually doesn't exist in the universe of th possible things. No, I understand I change the question. what I say, right? So the loop yeah, is kind so of. So there's, there's, there's a subtlety here which is that every medium, and that includes novels, like printed word, that include movies, that includes theater. You know, movies are actually a bunch of big flat people on a rectangle. And so all of the language of movies, you know, the mise-en-scene, the, you know, the montage, the, the over-the-shoulder shot, the, you know, the two-shot, everything, close-ups, it's all been evolved because there are limitations of the medium. You see the same thing with, oh, Shakespeare, iambic pentameter, you know, there's a limitation, iambic pentameter, so you work with it. So I think that every single medium of communication we've ever developed has come with it some kind of rules that come from what it can do and it can't do. And when it's, if it's a rich, valid medium that's about the expression of things we care about, you know, love and connection and, you know, and things that matter to us to talk about, we keep working with that medium and we figure out how to do it as we want to do. If we don't do that, that means it's probably not a very good medium in the first place. So I, again, I think it's really, 
there's no, there's no magic anything. Every medium has its power and its limitations, and you're not going to stop going to the movies because you can see things in the air between you. Uh, I think we have to learn what it can do and then try to turn that toward human purposes. But it's a very good point you're making. Hi, Alexandru Danku. Uh, I'm great talk. Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, looking at the recent history of communication technology. Hmm. If you look at the radio, then at the television, and then at the computer. Yeah. Uh, like the, the first applications on the computer were actually the movies on a, on a CD. Yeah. So it was kind of like the TV. Yeah. And if you just look a little bit into the future, at the, the next step after the computer, after uh, this medium, what, um, what, what do you see? What do I see? Uh, <laughs> I think the problem is that all we can do in any one generation is create possibilities because we are strangers in a strange land. We are not natives. Um, so we need to provide possibilities to children about the world they will make and we have to do these things incrementally. So I don't know languages that don't yet exist, and you don't know languages that don't yet exist. All we can do is try to use our understanding of what has worked before and to look into the future and try to project out and say, what's the best we can do? But we cannot produce examples of artifacts from the future. So um, I can't answer your question literally, but again, I'm an optimist, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, Albrecht has a few things to say before we close, but I, if we could have the lights back up a bit. I have one poll. We've been here together for 60 minutes. How many of you in the last 60 minutes had an interesting new idea? Yes. We win. Thank you. So, uh, I'm giving a vision talk. I was inspired by Gregory. No, I'm not. <laughs> but there is something more to come, hopefully also enjoyable. Uh, the dinner, the evening event is happening at the Kulturbrauerei, the culture brewery. 